good tell for many years I have okay I'll go I'll step one back before that if we look at tech or more to the point of the use of the data that you've got I've obsessed over the fact that our industry is sometimes a little bit guilty of making emotional decisions rather than data-driven decisions because we are all so passionate about coffee and food because they are things that you get passionate about it's very different from you know manufacturing widgets and uh, you know nuts and bolts or whatever um, I have actually in the past recommended a number of EPOS and TIL systems and uh, they have let me down quite badly. Um, I actually put in an EPOS system into our garden centres and we lost 55,000, spent 55,000 pounds and they went bust at the end of the year. Um, that was a very, very, very painful thing. We then had to spend another 35,000. Now, the reason why uh, I really like Good Till is that Good Till have been recently bought over by, um, uh, by SumUp and they've raised 900 million. They are going nowhere. <laughs> I did an interview with uh, Animesh Chowdhury, who is the founder and chief technology officer, yeah, and uh, recently, and it was really, really interesting because they have invested and pivoted really heavily during COVID, and they're working very, very hard to come up with some sort of, I can't remember the term that Animesh used, and I keep misquoting him, but it's effectively along the lines of digital equivalency, in other words, giving an independent coffee shop the same level of data and ability to make decisions as would have Marks and Spencers down the road, that kind of thing. That's a reasonable summary of it as well. So during COVID, they built out a Good Eats app, um, which we'll talk a little bit, but they, they reacted very, very well. They have over 2,000 customers in the UK alone, um, and as I say, I am now increasingly becoming familiar with their system on behalf of clients, getting in and looking at data and then trying to make decisions. So a little tiny piece of a context on that as well. The, I, sorry, I'm John Richardson. I work at a company called The Cafe Experts. And what we do is we actually help people make more money in their business. Don't teach you how to make a better cup of coffee. Uh, I haven't, actually I've never made a good cup of coffee, <laughs> but I haven't made a cup of coffee properly with a machine for over 20 years. So we teach people how to run better businesses to make more money. Now one of the key principles that we talk about is this thing called the game of 1%, whereby there is no step change going to happen in our industry. There was a step change that happened whenever Starbucks started. Um, they turned everything on its head and doubled the price of a cup of coffee. That's not going to happen. What we've got is incremental change. Now, for you managing your business, what that means is looking at 1% that you can improve along the way. And you can't do that unless you can look at the data and make decisions properly off the back of that. In other words, you know, 1% more people through the front door, 1% more in terms of uh, average transaction value, little 1%, 1% off the wage bill. Uh, if you, you, you're managing small things um, and you end up then with a lot more money at the bottom line. So uh, that's for another day, but the principle is <coughs> ultimately you need better data and as I say, we've got um, Cameron here and Josh coming along in a second too. We'll also be talking about the data piece. Now, um, with that said, um, explain to me a little bit then about what's going on. Actually, there's some very interesting stuff that they did. What, and, I, and we're deliberately within this Cafe Insights series, not just going through what happened in COVID. Everybody knows about that, but there are some interesting developments that went on in Goodtail and products that you developed. Um, so can you just sort of summarize a little bit what happened in COVID and the benefits of that to the consumer and what you're kind of working on now? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So obviously back in March, it was a really, really scary time. We are propped up by the hospitality industry and the cafes and pubs and um, chains out there that, 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 you know, support our business. So it was a really scary time when all of that ground to a halt. Um, lots of uncertainty, as everyone knows. We're in a, maybe a lucky position. It's probably more testament to the foresight of our incredible development team that we've got. We had a product um, that sat alongside our core till system, um, like a click and collect solution. It was a, kind of in its incubation phase. Um, a lot of coffee shops thought this might be quite cool for some of our regulars to sort of do some queue busting. It didn't have a lot of uptake. Obviously when COVID struck, sort of overnight, it became law that you needed table service in every establishment around the UK. So this product that we had that was, again, in its incubation phase, 
became such a valuable piece of technology that everyone needed to implement. So again, testament to our incredible development team. They're very, very clever guys. And um, yeah, they were able to quite quickly, like a lot of the hospitality industry, kind of on your toes, quite agile and adapt to that situation, pour a lot of resource into the product and develop it into something that was fully fledged, but be able to manage such a large volume of, of literally millions of pounds going through the platform on a, on a daily, weekly basis for all of our client base. So that was implemented in about one, two weeks. So incredible turnaround time for, for that piece there. Um, and yeah, it, 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 it kind of you know led to our, our acquisition by SumUp. So SumUp are a payments company and, and uh, they, they, they acquired us just before the new year. So it's been fantastic for us. And it's again, testament to the, 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 the team and the development work that, that happened with that Good Eats platform. Um, now it's it's about continuing that growth and we've got amazing booster sort of from sum up to be able to pour more resource into all the teams we've got um, and the products that we have so you know it's not just a till system as i talked about we've got the online ordering um stock loyalty you know online bookings we're, we're aiming for this one platform approach for our customers out there to be able to just log on and, and manage everything from one system yeah so there's a there's a couple of interesting things within that, there's actually one specific story that I think is quite interesting. Uh, I have a client who they use uh, the Good Eats app and it has really benefited them in the sense that it makes it very easy for the customer to put to give a tip. So the, the tips have gone through the roof for that client. And of course, when you think about that classic cafe coffee shop model, not a lot of tip giving goes on in the past. And therefore, if we, we have this recruitment issue out there in the industry, um, and if you work in a cafe or a coffee shop, your tips are going to be wildly lower than they are in a restaurant. So to have that ability then to this, you, this client is finding it much easier to retain staff because they're getting tips. Now, I don't know how much that was instinctively built into it, but it's a real benefit in terms of how it all works at the moment. Um, so. The, so what what sort of patterns have you been seeing that you know in terms of the, or what, as as we move out of it now there's a couple of questions then as we move out of it um, what patterns are you seeing in terms of of the consumer behavior and the continuing use of those apps you know there's this there are two sides in terms of people there's a whole bunch of people want to get away from apps as it were and there's a whole bunch of people generally an age-based thing that are just you know well actually I'm really really comfortable with this so are you seeing continuing uptake in that yeah a, a lot of factors go into it I'd say like um, geographically so location plays a big part in it as well uh, city centers town centers they tend to be a bit more receptive to, to the sort of technology that you need in terms of QR codes on tables and and, uh, and managing your orders yourself um, so yeah if you're a little bit kind of um, you know, smaller towns and villages and stuff that that might be a bit more of a blocker. So, yeah, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, yeah, it, it's just about being open to, to yeah. adapt the technology and being flexible enough to have a bit of a blend of the two. So that's what we're seeing now. Is you know, we, we don't have to have table service anymore. A lot of a lot of customers have and, and the cl the actual end user have gotten used to that. Yeah. Um. So people have stuck with it. Other yeah. people have gone. You know what? I'll go back to my standard service at the bar. Um. Other people have had a bit of the blend of the two. So yeah. it's it's it just you know it depends on a lot of things, doesn't it? But giving them the options is is what we're trying to do. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it it, it, it it's so my card only has a QR code in it, and those little leaflets that are there. That's just QR code, and what that does is, if you if you scan that, it'll take you through to Messenger, and you just type in panel, you get all of these, the recordings of these will send them out through to you. Now, we deliberately did a plus a little report in terms of how to build, uh, how to build average transaction value throughout the day. It's a really easy way to do it. But the point is, I couldn't have done that pre-COVID. There's a whole bunch um, of there's a whole bunch of stuff that people have learned how to do and are more comfortable to do in terms of tech. Now, as I say, some people are going, yeah, I don't really want to do QR codes. And there is an age difference. There are geographical differences. But we deliberately did it that way almost to try and prove the point. And I think the there's a, you know, we there's a finite period of time to talk about the whole tech thing because you can go into so many different areas but I think the the loyalty stuff um, the the youth they're getting away from the little card with 10 stamps to actually having proper loyalty built into your 
uh, your EPOS system and everything talking together properly and is huge in terms of, we were talking a little about in the previous session about some of the trends being in terms of retaining customers, trying to make them be part of your business as a tribe. So that is an enormous amount easier to do if they are actively, if you've got their data and can actually then be able to reward them. I mean, I'm assuming there are certain ways that you could, does that work within the system? 100%, yeah, it's, it's, it's a massive part of it. It's, it's difficult, everyone's on uh, their different journeys and, and reassessing different points of, of their businesses and then in turn the technology and the tools that they have. But loyalty is one of those, it's, it's so powerful and I always try and drive it home to people. When you're collecting information yeah. on your customers, you can then, you've got data on all of their email addresses, phone numbers, you know, and, and the, you can filter what they're buying off of you, how often they're buying. So those sort of trends and patterns you can look at really easily, yeah. analyze, and then action on it and, yeah. and, and send special offers and promotions. You can group your customers together. So, of course, it's, it's, it's so powerful. So if, um, you, if you think about that from, a, from a almost, if you take a bunch of customers that you might then analyze off the back of that and you look at and see what they're buying and you see that there's a lot of customers out there just buying a single cup of coffee. It's a really, I talk about in our business, most of my job is about filling gaps looking for where the gaps are in the business and then filling that gap. Now that's an obvious gap. I've said it for years that if you look out at 10.30 in the morning and see single cups of coffee, you've got it wrong because you don't have a strong enough bun offer, whether it's say, savory or sweet. Now, if you, that gives you the ability to look at where the gaps are. Now that's, that applies in, in any part of the business. So I have a number of clients who use the Good Till system and what I'm always doing is I go in, I download the CSV file, I then, I then punch it through to, um, um, uh, to an Excel file and then you just play around with it and you find the gaps. Now there are various reports and so on that I think are, it's, it's a fairly continual level of process, uh, uh, of progress within that within the app, but it's very easy to look and, uh, and, and download data and go, we are really obviously missing out on that. So for example, I have two specific clients, both using good till data, and uh, I always talk about a sweet and a savory balance. So within your business, often there's a, too much of an emphasis on one side versus the other, and, that, and that, that's a gap. So one client, speciality coffee shop, two locations uh, north of England, uh, their savory, we're looking at ratios as well, all the time. Their, their, their percentage of their weekly take on savory items was 4%. That's an earth-shatteringly large gap that you just fulfill with a better savory offer at lunch and various other times of the day. Now, during the same week, I was analyzing data from another client, and in full disclosure, that client is more sandwich bar-based cafe, but their sweet percentage was only 8%, and therefore, that's a big gap quite as dramatic, but that's what one of the things that we talk about is trying to make sure that on a weekly basis, you get into your till system, whether it is good till or not, and actually look at what has gone on in the previous week. And if you do that as a consistent process, you've got sort of got 52 tests per year where you have your data from the, you, you, in other words, you, you can look at this week, we, we, we've got last week's data and we noticed that you know, there's a gap in terms of this or that particular item isn't selling. So then you tweak your merchandising, you maybe tweak a bit of menu or you tweak a little bit of what the customers, or the staff are saying, uh, maybe some signage, but not too many things. And then the next week, you go in and you just download the report. Oh. You, download, you, know, you download the reports and then you see immediately what that, what that has done. So it allows you to go, Either that has that didn't work, you know, we've made a mistake. We won't do that again. Or we've got this that has increased the sales of that group of items by X percent, um, and then and then and then you can start to apply that across the board. Hey, mate, now, now I need to get my um, up. I think, yeah. Oh yeah, get my up. Um, so, so that's it's, it's kind of a really critical thing in terms of <coughs> that's making data-driven decisions. So you, you, whether they work or not, you've got, you've got, you're, you're building it by the 1%. So you look at that, as I say, this, there's, that 4% of savory is an extreme example. 
but that, that's a huge gap. But also then if you look at, I mean, a very, very simple one that I did many, many years ago was simply putting name and price on all items in our garden centers. Looked at the till, and I mean a till, I have to look at the end of the week, you know, that for the weekly sales, but we, we get a 6% growth in that. Now you're just, that's just using data to make better decisions in a dispassionate way. Now, that's quite useful because along comes at the same time, Josh, who has been over there being a proper grown-up roaster and coaching people. And Josh is the director of coffee at Clifton Coffee Roaster. He um, has been in and around the coffee world for a reasonable chunk of time, um, competed at quite a high level. So proper, I, I hate to use the term, but proper coffee geek, proper, you know, really, really understands coffee extremely well. But... Josh is also a system process data driven guy yep. and um, um, and they have been he's been working very closely with Microsoft um, and one of the key things that we were, we've been talking about ties directly through with what we're doing through with Goodtill but it's about using the data properly so perhaps Josh you could expand a little bit on on, on what that actually means and what you can do with, we've just been talking about the use of data on a weekly yeah. basis, 52 tests as in one per week, looking at the data, analyzing it, and then making changes. Um, so what sort of stuff have you been working on? And also, I know you've had like, enormous benefits from it within Clifton as well. Yeah, totally. I think the most exciting thing for us, um, well, the thing I get most excited about is, is the term data. And I think sometimes when you think of coffee at a third wave level or a craft level, the word data and specialty yeah. coffee couldn't be further apart. Uh, but I think the word data often becomes an obstacle when we think about big data or tech or spreadsheets and numbers, etc. Whereas I really like to think of data as just in decisions that we make every single day. The fact that I chose to put my shoes on today and tie my laces, that I took the right tube to get off here at the right stop. I'm, I'm making data-driven decisions whether I like it or not, and I'm here right now. So I think for us to be able to just understand the amount of data that we process in coffee, whether that's from where coffee is grown to eventually how it's roasted through to how it's delivered and then made in cafes, uh, we process far more data and we generate far more data than, than we realize. So one of the uh, things that we've been really looking at over the last 18 months is the amount of data, where it's feeding to, whether that's timesheets through the till system, whether that's through forms that we collect feedback on, whether that's just through our, our, our sales accounts, um, and then creating a data model, a hub that we uh, have so that we can have all our data in one place. I was getting to a point where I was almost taking one to two days a week just to collate all the different CSV files and yeah, spreadsheets yeah. From, from different systems and, uh, and, and then collating them to go into meetings. So through the departments that I work with, being able to make strategic decisions, to be able to understand where we're at, what's our current state, and where we want our future state to be based on the data that we have. So we've been pulling this all together. We've been quite heavily involved, as you said, in, in the Microsoft stack. Um, and it's been quite a natural transition for us. I think most businesses operate with an Outlook email. They probably use Excel for, for something or other. Um, or even, not even just in Microsoft, some of the Google Drive stuff that you can use as well, or Sheets, etc. cetera. Um, so it's been really fascinating for me to now see a visual representation of what we're doing, not just spreadsheets. Uh, I know often that can put people off, you know? Um, so it's been really great for us to see visual data presented to us so that we can tell stories with it um, and also get people excited and engaged with it. I mean, I think, you know, uh, I'm smirking because um, we did a, I did a, a session yesterday on creating your business as a system that can produce profit. So three hour paid session, down, three and a half hour paid session downstairs. And, um, and, and, and I'm a little bit of a spreadsheet geek and you know, you're always trying to check in with the audience as to whether it, it, it's all making sense in terms of what you're doing. And I then asked a question about, you know, which bits do they switch off from? And it's the spreadsheet that I put up. It's the Excel spreadsheet that I put up. And, you know, people, most people, this is a passion-driven industry. And people, mm. yeah, some people are Excel fanatics. Uh, and I have clients that are Excel fanatics, but, but yeah, you know, it, this is about tearing data into stories to make decisions. And you'll notice this is the smallest audience that we've had out of all the talks so far because this is not sexy. And, um, but what we're trying to do here is use the data to make more money. So if you look at all of those aspects of the business and analyzing the data, forget about the fact that it's a spreadsheet because what, what both scenarios allow you to do 
is to tell a better story in a simpler way that doesn't just look like an Excel spreadsheet. So what I'm doing whenever I'm trying to fill gaps is downloading CSV files, turning them into tables in Excel, but by the time I present it to the customer, I sort of show them all that stuff just to show how much work I've done, <laughs> but they don't want to see it. They want to see the story told in a really clear way, you know, graphically, um, you know, whether it's pie charts or anything, but just something that goes, oh, I get it. You know, that, so whenever I was talking about that, that client that only had 4% of the savory, that's a pie chart. So you're just, that, you just, know, that, that, you don't want to see the rest of it. And she is a spreadsheet fanatic, actually. But, um, but, but th that's the opportunity of that. So if you think about the use of the data, whether it's sales, um, whether it's loyalty in terms of repeat customers, um, your little one percent on all of those, if you can get that information out easily, you can make a really substantial difference to the bottom line. Because you know, one one percent sales, or you can and, and sit there and look at okay, well, let's what would two percent onto our prices on a really simple basis do in terms of extra profitability, and it's just tweaking and adjusting that now. Um, that's, that's all simple spreadsheet stuff, but what we're basically saying here is that the tools to do that more easily and get it out in a format that you don't have to sit there and plow away through CSV files mm. are increasingly out there. Yeah. yeah, we've really sort of tried to dial into that is that most uh, applications, um, even if it's just your phone these days, it, it'll give you an activity report and it's just, counting in the background what's going on but when you see that activity report it's, it's engaging it's simple it's telling a story so uh, that's been really important for us to get other people engaged into into all the departments that we have in our roastery but I think this would work for any business yeah. as well is to say well this is how it's represented to you this is what the story looks like how can you then take the story and take on because with the people that we have in, in each of the departments that we have in our wholesale team in our roastery um, or people that deal, deal directly with coffee shops as well they are the best people for those jobs. That's yeah. why they're in those jobs. So if we can give them an, a, a greater understanding, we can use data to, to enlighten them, but present it in a really light manner that's engaging. We often find that people then, a month down the line, with their reports, with their dashboards, are asking it even more questions. Yeah. They're coming to me, how can we ask more questions? How can we understand things more? Um, and I think building up that picture then, yeah, just speeds up the process of decision yeah. making, yeah. but makes it more enjoyable as well because you, you, you've got so much more input from it. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 this, when I first met Josh, we were with a client and uh, we were sitting, I think we, we were doing projections and that's just sitting on, uh, <laughs> he's a bit geeky, so he has a massive big TV <laughs> in terms of the spreadsheet being up there. So the spreadsheet's up there looking really dry and we're talking about the projections. Now, he understands his way, actually, <laughs> in fairness, as we joked about, it's his wife who is quite extraordinarily good at spreadsheets. So there's this spreadsheet that's a really nice spreadsheet, but it still puts people off. And that's when the conversation started in terms of, a, you know, I can sit and have the conversation with Josh or with, or with Cameron or with anybody who's, who's kind of interested in data. And people who are interested in data forget that most people aren't interested in data. And then, or then perhaps they look at an Excel spreadsheet um, as Helena says, who works for me, um, I say, I hate works for me, works with me. Um, the, the, the Excel spreadsheet that she saw yesterday just took her back to sort of terror at university of having to do the, the Excel piece. So you think about that in terms of, you know, me um, and Josh, as I say, or Cameron, and a client, all of whom are maybe understanding and getting the spreadsheet. We've got to get that to trickle down to a manager and yeah. then the rest of the staff. So therefore, it has to be in a format that you can then use. So you think that top level, you making decisions, but then being able to present it through to staff so that they, presenting it through to the staff so that they go, all right, yeah, that makes complete sense. Um, and that's, that's the battle half the time. So you want them on board uh, so that they, they can help you to make those decisions. I think, I think as well, it's, talk about spreadsheets, there, there's tools out there that, that like with till systems, whichever till system you use, you can pull a really easy report on best-selling items in the last month. Like you know, that's where you can start. We were talking before 
it's never a good time to reassess your, the data that you've got. You're always looking at something else or, or ensuring quality of service. That's the type of thing you get caught up in. That's your passion. That's why you get into opening a coffee shop or a or hospitality business in general. That, that's what you want to be focusing on. So this isn't something that people like doing generally. It's never a good time yeah. to look at it, but there are little things that you can start with, like with your POS software, what, what's our best seller in the last month? You know, um, gross profits, what's our most profitable item? What's our highest margin? Th these reports exist in whatever system, decent till system you've got. Click on it, it takes seconds to look at it and say, all right, these are our best products. Let's move them to the front of the shelf, like, or, or push mm. them in some way. It's, it's, you can start easily. So, the, the, so the, the, the data telling a story thing is really important. When you log into Goodtill, so I, I log into a number of Goodtill accounts, or sometimes I'm sent, you know, screen captures and so on, or sometimes actually a phone held up on a Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, but when you log in, first of all, I don't know whether this is the default, but it's what I generally see is that you, it's the top 10 selling items is in a graph and the top 10 most profitable as well. And I immediately, because I just look at this stuff all the time, and analyze P&Ls all the time, I've, I have an immediate story told by that rather than, and the, it's there. It's just there immediately. And then you can go in and go, okay, now let's do a report and look at that in a little bit more depth. And you can keep a whole chunk of it, you know, within the whole POS system, sort of say, you don't always have to take it outside. And, you know, we, we had a conversation the other day in terms of a, specific client that is building out multiple locations and they are trying to look uh, in better detail at the various ratios of what happens in terms of let's say uh, coffee and a morning bun off that's a classic ratio that I would look at and uh, they they've been struggling to get that data and actually um, uh, the the it's I didn't know how to do it within Goodtill, but it was about three clicks to actually get that data. And again, you can keep all of that within there, and then, you know, and then and then they can use it like that. So it doesn't always have to be taken out, but some of those broader, longer strategic decisions kind of want to have it out there, out into a report, and then make it look a bit better to make long, bigger strategic decisions is mm. kind of the key thing. Yeah, I think that's the way that things are going with everything in, in the coffee industry. We're seeing more and more IoT technology come into, it's been in bean to cup machines for a long time, but the three temporaries here as an example, Lamazocco, I know other manufacturers are starting to, to put this telemetry in. Yes. So I think you know projections for the next five or 10 years that we're gonna to start to see is that um, just like you're driving your car now and it'll tell you that you need an oil change. It doesn't know you need an oil change, just it's been counting the number of miles that you've yeah. done. Similarly, we're going to see this, I think, across across the industry. So more and more things are going to be able to, to speak to each other um, so that, yeah, the, the picture, the data model that you can, they can pick up can just make things uh, speak to each other more, more effectively, more efficiently. Uh, and then through that automation, um, we can, I think the thing I get most frustrated about reports um, is that a report isn't, or a dashboard or a, a spreadsheet isn't there necessarily just so that you can look back. It's so that you can make a decision yeah, going forward. Exactly and I think right. That's, that's the most important thing with them. It's like, I don't, I don't necessarily care about what we've done. It's where we are now and how we can look yeah. forward with that information at hand to then to yeah. then go forward as a business. That's right, that's right. And, and if it's too much of a slog to get that information, yep. then you don't do your 52 tests, you know. That's, it's like you take what happened last week, and then you have a look at perhaps what happened, uh, what happened last week, what happened that, last, that week last year, and then look at the two together and see what the patterns are now. You know, this week last year makes no sense. <laughs> this is one of this, you know, it's kind of, and then so sometimes when I'm looking at people's, it's like, okay, give me some pre-COVID stuff. And they're going, well, yeah, but it was a different layout. So yeah, the last year stuff, as we move forward, is really beneficial to look at. But the ability to then quickly get that data into a format mm. that you can then make a decision from is what it's all about. Um, and as I say, you know, then make those little tweaks um, because, yeah, if, if, it's, if it's a really lengthy process, you just, you just don't do it properly. So, I mean, what, what, what sort of stuff, additional stuff are you working on at Good Tell at the moment? Are there, are there any new, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm sure that, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, 
are completely customer led we always have been for the first kind of uh, two years of the product's life cycle we put it out there for free and said you know give us feedback and yeah, this yeah. is where we built our roadmap from and that's what we continue to do um, at the moment we're in a bit of a position following the acquisition by sum up where um, we, we need to scale the product we have been scaling the product quite aggressively over yeah, the yeah. last kind of few years yeah, but yeah. Um, the, the, the growth we're looking for and where we need to take it uh, we need to lay some some foundational stuff down in the in in the back end so um, the dev guys are, are working hard at that it's a big job and, and that's where our focus is right now that, that's that's just where we're at but um, yeah yeah we talked a little bit about the loyalty and the use on the use of the building loyalty that way now um, that ability to sort of really understand what's going on with the customer um, and being able to communicate with them is extremely beneficial to so say we talked about the use of sort of building your cafe coffee shop as pe a tribe that people want to be part of and that that can be any business you know you will have people who will be want to be part of the clifton coffee tribe and to an extent the sort of stuff that you're doing over there is all about building tribe stuff the fact that you know, you originally, you know, did the competitions and so on. You build out a tribe that people want to be part of. Now, the, my, I have a very close friend, a guy called John Davey, who set up and sold junglers for 36 million. He then, they messed it up and he had a clause in the contract to be able to buy it back for a pound. Um, and um, they messed it up. He bought the brand back for a pound, built, franchised it out and sold it for 11 million. So, you know, he sits in the quite clever category. And he wanted me to help him with a, um, he wanted me to help him with uh, a talk that he was doing for a group of business coaches, uh, 800 business coaches in Spain. So we built out what were the five fundamentals of the success of junglers. And um, uh, I can't remember all five of them. One of them, was data-driven decisions and he used to do it to a really extreme level he used to do it in a particularly non-tech way so I'll not go into it too much but really really data-driven decisions but this the the we then said at the end okay so we've got these five um, if you had to get rid of four and there was one secret to the success of that business uh, what do you leave and he instantly said it is eliciting negative feedback asking for what went wrong so every monday people that went into jonglers would be phoned and asked how did your meal go how did the night go? it's quite expensive you know night out so this is 40th birthday parties it's, it's, it's big events and and they keep getting asked how it went until they get a negative and then the negative used to go into one of four buckets as he would call it all the managers were brought together and then they put a system they put a process in place like I talked about yesterday in our session, to fix that. Now, the point is, if you can actually get hold of the customer <laughs> and you've got their phone, well, you're not going to phone them up maybe quite so much in our world, but you might, um, um, or you can email them and you ask them, what could we do better? It, it, nobody really wants to do it, actually, most of the time, but it is a staggeringly powerful way to build the business. But you don't, you can't do that with a 10 stamp card. Now you can have lots of conversations with people and try and have those conversations. But if you are actively using a process within your technology to contact them and say, you know, you haven't been here for a while, why? You know, <laughs> or um, what can we do better? Multiple different versions of this. What can we do better? You will get data that will allow you to improve the business. So the loyalty piece is, is, is an awful lot more than just building a tribe that people want to be part of. It's about allowing you to then make decisions, not just on you know, um, how many buns we sold on a Tuesday morning, but also on, um, on, on, on then what could we do better? Well, what, do you, what does that, why is that tribe, why have those people gone somewhere else? Or why are they not coming as often as they are? Why is their average transaction value only four pounds um, and all of this done well particularly if you reward them really helps to build a much stronger business so the, you know again it's all just data it's all just data and the use of tech and the use of these kinds of things so I mean I don't know I mean what, what sort of money to get good tell in for a single location what sort of money are we talking about 
Yeah, it depends. If it's just one terminal, it's literally as cheap as about £495 we can just do up from um, after 12 months there is a software charge of £29 a month but yeah so it's the standard POS is £29 a month okay so, so it's just a subscription we sort the hardware out for you it's all iPad based so fairly cheap to kind of invest in and maintain and it's 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 not a lot to, to take that first step in terms of getting going and you can scale the product up from there so if you, if you consider that from the perspective, you take the £495 and you maybe depreciate that order over a couple of years. In other words, it's a very small amount on a monthly basis. And then you look at, um, actually, it's actually just £10 a month at that stage. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> £10 a week. £10 a week. A week. So then you, you, so that's, that you always try and project stuff over a year. So you have £10 a week to get better data. And then you've got 30 quid a month. Um, I've just put your price up by a pound. <laughs> You've got 30 quid a month then on an ongoing basis. So if you think about my, my, the, my little 1% thing, and I always, I, I, I'm writing a new book at the moment, and it's about two cafes, one doing three, both doing 300 grand, and then applying the 1% principle. So if you can make you know, 1% of extra profit on that, by using your one percent of extra profit, just by using the data, and you've got you've got to pay some till system, <laughs> you know, and it doesn't have to necessarily be good till. I mean, obviously, <laughs> we're not going to start punting lots of other ones <laughs> when they're sitting here, but you know, th that one percent is really easy to get by using the data better. And you're so that's three hundred, uh, that's three thousand pounds over the year, and you are paying three hundred and sixty quid for the till system, but. There's an enormous amount. It's not just what you can put to the bottom line, because you should be able to put a lot more than that using it properly, but you should be able to build the sales on top. So in terms of any of these things, um, in terms of your tech, you want to try and look at it like that in terms of increased revenue and better savings. So wastage is a really big one. Um, that, that, and that ties in with what Josh is saying in terms of projecting forward into the future. I have a client that they're really struggling to have a good, to understand how much wastage they're getting over various items. You control that by a few percent and, 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 and it you know, changes everything. So in, term, in terms of Clifton, what, how, how did it, how did, what were the biggest difference in terms of the, uh, what, what were the benefits in terms of sales and co with savings yeah. and so on, so over and above necessarily just being able to tell the story? So our trajectory is, has been upward since Clifton Coffee started. So we've never really struggled as the industry has you know, grown and, and continue to grow on that level but what we've wanted to do is gain a deeper understanding as we've grown uh, all these different asset you know different parts of our business that can so easily be overlooked or forgotten about as you're constantly trying to deal with growth so um i've just been obsessed with with reporting trying to find out more information to deeper understand the business we're ob obsessed with this continuous improvement culture continually trying to attack any waste that we see in the business whether that's time whether that's over processing whether that's excess inventory whether that's the rework of defects whatever it might be so that we can deliver better service better products uh, to our customers on time in full that's all we try to do it's, it's really really simple so as we started to, to dive in here i just really wanted to find one one system that allowed me to take all of the data that I was already sifting through and have it in one place. So uh, within the Microsoft stack, Power BI, has anyone heard of Power BI? Show of hands, yeah, okay, there's a couple of users, that's great. And I wanted to learn how to use it, uh, so started where everybody starts when they want to learn something these days on YouTube, watch a video, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and slowly start to pick it up from there. We already had a Microsoft business license, Power BI is an additional seven ninety nine a month. It saved me about a day and a half, two days a week. This was, this was the key thing. So I've saved about, uh, worst case scenario, two days a week. Best case scenario, uh, you know, uh, a day, oh, other way around, a day, a day a week saved in, in just generating, creating the same, the same reports. And now within our data model, the data model took us three months to build. Yeah. It was quite a long time. We had to deal with external sources, get yeah, API, yeah. API links, set up some flows, but there's lots of support out there to do that. Um, and I'm more than happy to chat to anybody about that as well. But um, once we got that system in place, it was brilliant then to send these dashboards out to each of the departments. And they started asking quite more and more questions and coming to me with solutions based off the data yeah. that they're looking at, rather than coming and asking me questions that I didn't have answers to that I would have to then go and find out myself as well. Yeah. So now we've got this system within Power BI set up. We've got all our team with licenses and the data pushes, refreshes every hour 
uh, of our working week. So you're constantly getting fresh and fresh data. You're not looking back at last month trying to work out what's going to happen this month. You can look back as far as an hour ago and see how you're performing, see what's going on as a business. Um, not just for profit, but for service, for stock. If we can see something that's selling well, then we're going to need more of it. We need to produce more of it. Um, so it's sort of a, a full loop system for us to be able to, to understand, to learn, uh, and, and correct to move forward. Well, there's, a, there's another part of that loop involves the customer because, as I say, that when we met, there was a customer, a client of both of ours. You know, there's, there's a little triangle. <laughs> And when we were discussing all of this, and he's looking at some of the dashboards that you were pulling up, it's like he's fascinated because he's then seeing it. Um, and he wouldn't be particularly tech driven, but he's just seeing it as this is fantastic. There, what can I have a look at my data and have a look at that? And then we all three of us go and we have a bit of a look at the layout of, 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 of some of the changes that are going on in that business. But the decisions that somebody that the client can make based off uh, data from that, that Josh is seeing on an ongoing basis from other clients and also his experience and understanding of layout and how that changes. But he can see then in real time the sales going up or down or how that affects. Mm -hmm. and it's, so, there, so it's a little bit, it's like, it's like that step past just looking at your own business. They have the ability to then go to that particular client. Well, look, actually, that change, look, you're, you're, for example, you know, the blend that you're using for your filter is way down, or look how much that's got it up. So it, now, that gets real loyalty. That client is going nowhere, yeah. going nowhere, because he, he knows that the roaster is doing, can give him, can really help his business. That's wildly different from just providing him with potentially a machine and potentially a good been to use for mm. his crowd. It is wildly different. So it, 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 it works in all sorts of different ways. Um, you know, if you think about every aspect of that, that's, that's not Josh out there selling that because he's providing data through to the sales team. But it's but that's still selling. It's still <laughs> it's yeah. actually retention. And it, and for us, we we see we see it all as solutions. So for us, it's not a push to try and force something on somebody. It's like we we have the solution for you. And there's nothing more satisfying than getting you know to meet up with a with a customer or a supplier for us, and we can focus on our conversation and the coffee. We've got the data. In some cases, I can tell that customer or that client more information yeah. about their business than we can because I'm constantly getting this push. And then it leads to the exciting part, which is the decision-making process yes. to be able to understand what's going on and then and then implement a positive change. And, yeah. th and that's the thing that gets me excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's a, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a fairly hefty point to bang across. I mean, I mean we just, we, we focused a lot in terms of data thing rather than a whole bunch of the other tech that is going on out there. But, it, you know, it, but actually, if you think about it at the end of the day, there is a whole bunch of other stuff that you can do. And this this piece that, this digital, is it digital maturity that he talks about? Yeah, digital yeah, maturity. Digital maturity, yeah, I always yeah, get it wrong. Just, yeah. uh, where you can get as much as possible through that one system. Now, stock take, mm. um, doing a stock take in an easy way. One of the things I talk about, there's a sort of a, a little sort of chart that we're building out in terms of quick win. So that, that, that little QR code that then leads through to all the videos from today's also then leads through to this little one page report, which we've got, which is like a really quick win to drive up average transaction value. Now, a not quick win, but really good way to increase your profitability um, is to do a stock-driven profit and loss on a weekly or a monthly basis. Very few people do it um, because it's quite hard. Um, it requires often spreadsheets um, and it requires a little bit of a commitment in time. If you can make that easier, um, you can make staggering differences to the actual profitability of the business. When we've put in stock-driven P&L for a business, we've never had less than a 3% increase of profitability. So if you take this fictional 300,000 pound business, 3% is, uh, what's that, nine grand. Now, um, when I did a whole bunch of work for the NHS, we did all sorts of cool stuff. We built out 27 new coffee shops for them. We did a whole bunch of staff training. We did a lot of stuff that we retained a load of jobs, lots of politically good stuff. They were losing 1.8 million over 20 million pounds with a turnover. We took that from 1.8 million of a loss to 700,000 pounds with a profit within about two years. And all the cool, sexy stuff helped a bit. 
The number one reason, though, that we managed to do that was by, by making sure that on a weekly basis, all those catering managers were creating a weekly profit and loss and sending it to me, which they hated doing because as an external person. But they had to do two things. They had to send the profit and loss with their percentages of wage cost and cost of sales. They had to say why it was like that. And then they had to say what they're doing next week, which is what Josh is saying, to try and rectify that. Yep. So that's, they, they, had, they were forced into the decision and then margins just increased dramatically. And say the other things helped but it was using the data in a fairly basic way um, to do that. Now, if you can do it through a till system, it's much easier to do or to delegate down to somebody else to do. Yeah. So um, thank you very much for your time. I don't know whether you have anything else you wanted to, to add in terms of that. Buy good till probably is what you're going to add. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, 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 I think we covered a lot, so uh, yeah. it's heavy stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, Hopefully I, I, you stuck I, with it all. <laughs> yeah, buy good till and buy Clifton coffee and <laughs> yeah, engage Josh to help you with all sorts of things. <laughs> yeah, no, I really appreciate your time. And say you. it's, it's, uh, um, I think it, it is a fascinating thing that this is the, you know, the, the least, least attended one, but this is arguably using this stuff properly is the quickest win, I think, out of any of the sessions that I'll be doing today. Um, Anyway, thank you for turning up. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.